Luke chapter 8. And as we approach the scriptures, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the attentiveness the attentiveness uh, to your word tonight, and we pray for more understanding to be added to our frame of reference tonight as we undertake uh, part two of this study. We do pray that God would clearly convey your word to each person in this setting tonight and to the ones who listen by recording and we recognize that that is all by grace that we might get to know you and and we pray with deep thanksgiving amen all right so luke 8 i'm going to read verse 18 again so take care how you listen For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and to whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken from him. Looking for my glasses, which I'll be able to get by without them. Um, So, Frame of reference verse. Again, a frame of reference is a structure of concepts, values, and views by which you evaluate more incoming information. We all have frames of reference, and frames of reference are important in human life, in various vocations and occupations and professions, uh, as we are educated and uh, as we learn on the job. And frames of reference are extremely important in the spiritual life. This book was not written uh, for nothing. It was written so that we might learn what constitutes the spiritual life, what constitutes our responsibilities as believers in Christ, uh, and to convey, of course, most importantly, the uh, attributes of God, the essence of God, the policies of God, God's important policy of grace that he blesses us, though we do not deserve it, and that he loves us, and that Love extends to every member of the human race, and there is nothing that we can do to uh, enhance his love for us or diminish his love for us. And he loves because he is love. And again, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And God demonstrates, present tense, his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, and it also says in that chapter, helpless to do anything about it. And it also says in that chapter, God's enemies. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so therefore, upon salvation, every believer in every time of human history has the wonderful opportunity to perceive what is going on in the world and what, is, uh, what the world is going to come to and to perceive that uh, in the current events of their own time, interpreting those those current events by the word of God, and then interpreting the things to come by the word of God, the Bible being its own commentary. 
And so, yes, there is the rise and the fall of nations and their boundaries, and even their rulers are predetermined by the sovereignty of God, and yet graciously, God never operates apart from the principles which he has revealed, the, the principles of divine establishment, the free volition, marriage, the family, national entity, the, the principle whereby if there are enough believers who are steadfast to the word of God at any given time in a nation, the nation will be preserved and will even prosper through the principle of blessing by association on account of those people. You get that from the Word of God and the, the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. You'll never get that from secular history books. And he never operates apart from principles he has not revealed. The sovereignty of God coexists with the free will of man, allowing human volition to be expressed fully. So the result is that even though uh, God has predetermined the conditions under which every nation will uh, exist, the sovereignty of God has also programmed the free will of man into his plan, and as a result, every generation is free to change its own destiny. Now, in some cases, as is coming in our nation, as the amount of believers positive toward the word of God dwindles on a daily basis, that generation of positive believers is still free to change its own destiny in the sense that, that we can not only survive but thrive even if our nation is under the occupation of a very tyrannical and oppressive government. Nothing is arbitrary or unfair about God's ways uh, and about God's ways in which he deals with nations. And when the nation declines or when it is destroyed, believers who are positive toward the word of God are still blessed through the blessing that sometimes comes through suffering, which we've studied uh, quite a lot about. But the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, to get back to that, that turns out to be a panorama of the greatest nations of antiquity, uh, and one of them being one which will be revived, the revived Roman Empire, in a future time. And is already, things are already gearing up for that revival. And uh, you can turn back to Daniel chapter 2 with me. Daniel chapter 2, and in Daniel chapter 2, in Nebuchadnezzar's In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he dreamed of a multi-metallic image. We won't get into the technical details of the prophetic word on that tonight, but the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream turns out to be a panorama of 
empires designed to allow man to realize that every event which occurs in human history is controlled by Jesus Christ. I'm trying to, to be very practical tonight. Daniel 2 verse 4 through Daniel 7 verse 8 is actually written in Aramaic, which was the court language uh, the diplomatic language of Daniel's day, the language of the Gentiles. And that's apropos because Daniel was giving a panorama of the world's history and future uh, to a Gentile ruler. And he was describing Gentile nations, Gentile empires, which would be enlarged and ultimately destroyed. God is speaking to the world. He's not just speaking uh, to his covenant nation through the Old Testament. He's speaking to the world. And Daniel interprets this dream and uh, in terms of the Chaldean Empire, followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and then the Roman Empire, and ultimately the revived empire uh, derived by, uh, we know all of this, derived by this portion compared with the later prophecies of Daniel and illustrated in the multimetallic image of, De of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams are four metals and then clay, and each, each subsequent metal is less valuable than its predecessor, illustrating that man does not improve in his ability to govern and in his ability to live with his fellow man. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. Anyone in this room, anyway, I, I don't see any uh, shocked faces tonight, but uh, uh, I think everybody gets that. We're in a, 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 a very trying situation globally today, uh, as well as nationally. So in the interpretation of this dream, Daniel 2, uh, verse 44, the upshot of this whole thing is Daniel 2, verse uh, 44, after he describes these Gentile nations, in Daniel 2 and verse 44, we have a kingdom that wasn't in the multimetallic image, but a kingdom which is coming. And Daniel 2 verse 44 in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it's, it will itself endure forever. And this is the very kingdom which John the baptizer and Jesus himself in the Gospels uh, predicted. And the specific term is used in Matthew exclusively 32 times translated correctly, it's usually translated the kingdom of heaven. It's, it, the correct translation is the kingdom from the heavens. And that is uh, the basis for that 
kingdom from the heavens used 32 times in Matthew was Daniel 2.44. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. The kingdom from the heavens, the kingdom God of heaven, the God of heaven will set up on earth. That was the proclamation of John who baptized and Christ whom John baptized and Christ who uh, then began his earthly ministry and the coming kingdom was the focal point of his ministry, of the Lord's ministry on earth. And over this kingdom, Jesus Christ will rule as an autocratic ruler. No democracy necessary because this will be a perfect form of integrity ruled by one who possesses perfect eternal integrity, and this is the only kingdom which will stand. It is a kingdom which will last for a thousand years and then give way to the new heaven and new earth still under the authority of these kingdom principles. And as a believer, you, with the completed canon of Scripture, the completed Bible, you are privy to the most marvelous information. And you are not only ab able to correctly interpret the meaning of human history when you come to understand more and more of the words, the Word of God, and when more and more of the Word of God becomes incorporated in your frame of reference, you are not only able to correctly interpret the meaning of history, but you'll know the future as well. And you'll understand the principles by which God controls the affairs of this world. And uh, you young people have access to this, people younger than yourselves in this room tonight, and older people as well. We all do. Historians do not understand these things. Political scientists do not understand. The, pe the people who call themselves political strategists, and others call them that as well, and uh, uh, I don't, I don't know, know actually what it, what their everyday job is. I guess they strategize political things, but they talk as if they know something uh, on, you know, uh, CNN and Fox and and uh, everywhere else, and they opine, and they opine usually on. They judge matters they have not heard uh, the, the specifics on through hearing spiritual truth, and so their judgments are shabby. They're folly. They come to nothing. You have access to information that political activists, including Christian activists, do not understand. We live in a world that is judged and a world system that is corrupt and doomed and will never be salvaged, will only be totally renovated 
by the, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And everything is going to play out exactly the way Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9, uh, say it will. And no matter what solutions human beings attempt to propose, no matter who on earth tries to establish a utopia, and there have been many attempts throughout history to attempt to establish that, and the final attempt is going to be under Antichrist, and all human attempts to bring peace and stability and order to the world have failed ministry or, or have failed miserably, and they will continue to fail miserably. And, and when we begin to understand these things, we take politics much less seriously. And you know, we have the privilege in, in this nation of being able to vote. But frankly, I'd, I'd, I'd prefer most people didn't vote because of what the electorate has, been come, has become in this nation. And I, and I vote I consider it a, a privilege and a responsibility, but I understand the reluctance of people who choose not to vote. And that may very well be me at some point. Because political solutions are just not going to get it. Never place your trust in political promises or political solutions. The promises will never come through. The solutions, they may try, but they won't work. And the failure of political solutions has frustrated the people in our nation, and rightly so, but to the point where they are willing to accept uh, things like socialism as a solution. And this, if you don't believe me, just look like, just look at the people we have in Congress, look at the people in our presidential administration, look at the people in the Supreme Court. The, the uh, political landscape is truly pathetic. I become less and less interested in it but we choose as a nation those who rule over us as our representatives. That's a wonderful privilege that we've had in this nation. But an unprincipled electorate, unprincipled voters in this nation will necessarily elect unprincipled rulers. And that is what's happened, and that's what will continue to happen. But take heart, because despite what happens to the nation, positive believers are going to thrive, and uh, uh, positive believers do not depend on environment political or otherwise. They depend on what's going on in their soul, in their very own spiritual life. And they depend on the spiritual information which comes to us graciously as we are regenerated. How are we regenerated? not by works of righteousness, which we have done, Titus 3, 5, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. 
And in this regeneration process, we receive the human spirit, which was lost at the fall when Adam fell, so that he was alienated from God. And we also receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And because of the newly created human spirit we receive at regeneration and the teaching ministry of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we have access to spiritual information we have not received, as Paul wrote in Second Corinthians or First Corinthians two twelve, we've not received the Spirit out from the world, but the Spirit out from God, that we might know the things freely given to us of God. That's the human spirit. And he goes on to say in verse 14. The soulish man, you see, we, the believer consists of body, soul, and spirit. The unbeliever only body and soul. The, the human spirit comes through regeneration. The unbeliever can talk spirituality. The unbeliever can assume he or she knows something of real spirituality. And by perhaps quoting a Bible verse here and there, they, uh, they may actually uh, give you some things that are spiritually real. But the natural man in the original language, the soulish man, the word in the Greek is soukekos, soulish, in 2 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, the soulish man is not able to apprehend spiritual phenomena. Pneumatikos is the word, spiritual information. But with the human spirit, we can. And the verse goes on to say, we compare spiritual information with spiritual information. That's another frame of reference verse. We don't go to a teaching session and quit. We come to the point in life where we recognize that in order to grow, into spiritual maturity, and in order to actually fulfill the spiritual life designed for us, we must be comparing spiritual information with spiritual information from the Word of God as a way of life for the rest of our lives. And that is the most amazing thing it will to the to the unbeliever it seems foolish stupid uh, and I could use another or several adjectives but it, it uh, doesn't seem like a fun life at all to a believer in Christ who begins to understand these things it becomes a way of life that is our life. And we, we grow spiritually. If, if you understand these things, you'll take the things that you see on CNN and MSNBC and Fox and wherever you see them, you'll take them a lot less seriously. The future of political solutions is it has no future, and the failure of these solutions have frustrated the electorate of our nation, but whose fault is it? We choose as a nation those who rule us and represent us. The breakdown is in the electorate, 
and specifically the 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 worst of it is in the believers of the electorate because never has so much been given to believers as has been given at the present time and never has so much been rejected. And an unprincipled electorate will elect unprincipled rulers. But as believers in Christ, we can do quite well anyway. I'd like you to turn quickly with me to 1 Kings chapter nine, uh, chapter 19. I'll tell you what, I'm going to uh, don't go there if you've wasted your time in going there. I don't have enough time to do without what I want to do tonight, but uh, there is one there is one passage that I have time to get through and I think to do justice to and that is a passage in Philippians chapter 2. You can turn there with me. Philippians chapter 2. In order to access the information which will keep us thriving in the future, that will keep us from embitterment, that will keep us from blaming others, that will keep us happy. In order to, we have access to that information, but in order to access the information, we must be teachable. And in order to be teachable, we must be humble. We must have true humility. And this is the great example in the Bible of true humility. It's in Philippians chapter 2. And in Philippians chapter 2, this was Paul's letter to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to begin at verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. What is translated as have this attitude is the present tense. It means continuous action. That's the present tense in the Greek, continuous action. It's in the imperative mood. That means this is a, a mandate. You don't have to do it. Again, you won't be forced to do it against your will, but if you, if you really want to serve God and fulfill the spiritual life and be a happy person and have access to the wonderful information God has given us, uh, you have to have this attitude. And the Greek word phroneo is used, P-H-R-O-N-E, long O, in English transliteration to think, to form, to hold an opinion, to judge. So form this opinion, judge this way, think in this way, in this mental attitude which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. So here we have God, and he existed and continued to exist in the form of God. He didn't empty that. He emptied the the, he emptied the privileges associated with his deity. As God, he could have had anything he wanted. 
but he chose to empty himself of that of these privileges in verse 7 but he emptied himself taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death obedient to who obedient to his father even death on a cross. For this reason, God, uh, for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So how was Christ promoted in the plan of God? Through humility. The same is required of us. The same is expected of us. And we have a guarantee of promotion as well. God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. He's, uh, James 4, 6, God resists the proud. The word means it's a military term. He strategically resists the arrogant. But he gives grace to the humble. And the only way that we can execute the spiritual life is through this attitude. And this attitude will take us into teachability, which is necessary in order to fulfill the spiritual life. Humility, genuine humility. And this is something we learn more and more about through the Word of God. The cosmic, sef the, the cosmic concept of humility is the, the soft-spoken person, the, the, the person who wrings their hands and talks swiftly. A, a lot of clergymen, you know, that uh, speak so soft and say such nice things. The biblical definition of humility is a mentality of the soul which accepts God's estimate of everything in life, of self. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but the life which I live now. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. A biblical definition of humility accepts God's estimate of others. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14, we are controlled by the love of Christ having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all were spiritually dead and were in need of a Savior. They were in need of one dying for all. God's estimate of circumstances. All things work to the good for those who love Jesus Christ, who are the called to, according to his purposes. All things work together for the good. Prosperity. 1 Timothy 6, verse 8. If, if you have uh, clothing and shelter, food, be content with these things. 
of prosperity and of adversity. Philippians 4, verses 11 through 12, Paul said, I know how to be content in whether and whatever state I'm in, whether it's adversity or prosperity. I've learned the secret to happiness. God's estimate of life itself, for to me to live is Christ. God's estimate of death, but to die is profit. For me to live is Christ, but to die is profit. The Apostle Paul, actually the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. Philippians 1 verse 21. God's estimate of unbelievers, including those who are are ruthlessly murdering people and murdering believers in Christ. Islamic fundamentalist extremists, people in ISIS, people in uh, Al-Qaeda, people in the Taliban. What is our estimate to be of them? What is God's estimate of them? God, in this way, loved the world, that he gave his unique son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. If I'm about to be killed by one or more of them, I've said this in the past. I pray that I have the opportunity and, and by God's grace, the fortitude, if the opportunity presents itself to at least be able to blurt out, have the time to at least be able to blurt out, Christ died for our sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. He tasted death for everyone, Hebrews 2 verse 9, and we are designated in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, as, ha- as his ambassadors of goodwill, beseeching every member of the human race, as was God in Christ, saying that you're trespasses aren't imputed to you. He was about to go to the cross for them. Be reconciled to God. God's estimate for believers, what's that? That we are not to judge another man's servant because To our own master we stand or fall. Romans 14, verse 4, and we all have an an individual relationship with our own master, which is really no one else's business. And in Romans 14, verse 4, that yes, we shall stand because God is able to hold us up. All right, with that, we'll close tonight and continue our lesson next week. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for what you've given us tonight. We thank you for your love for us, that great sacrifice of your son. We thank you for the giving of your son and for uh, we thank him for his willingness to fulfill your mission. We thank you that the horrible punishment, indescribable horribleness of that punishment, we thank you for the results that it yielded, that it purchased for us the gift of eternal life. So we thank you you tonight 
In the name of your Son, Jesus, amen.